Good morning. My name is Giuditta and I am a data scientist working for the Natural History Museum in Berlin. Today, I will be presenting the research I have been doing with my colleagues at the museum, Sabine von Mehring and Marike Petersen, about the use of machine learning to label objects with a potential colonial provenance. The work we are doing builds upon a research project on colonial history. As part of this project, historians design the decision tree to decide whether objects in the museum's collections have a, potential pro a, poten have a, have a colonial provenance or not. With our, with our work, we want to test whether suitable classifying algorithms can be defined to automate this process. The work I'm going to discuss started very recently, and this is a presentation of early and still provisional results. Before going into technical details, I would like to provide some historical background about the colonial objects in the museum's collections. In the period from 1884 to 1919, when the German Empire had colonies in Africa, the Pacific and China, you can see them in the map, the Berlin Natural History Museum played a prominent role in imperial politics. The museum initiated a large number of expeditions and provided colonial officials and military personnel in the colonies with collecting instructions and materials. The number of objects arriving in Berlin was overwhelming. Literally tons of objects reached Germany from the colonies year after year. The Berlin Natural History Museum critically reflects on its historical responsibility. Our colleagues from the Humanities of Nature Department are dedicated to researching the collection history with a focus on colonial context. Several research projects examine colonial provenances and the group is developing guidelines on dealing with natural history collections from colonial context. The museum is also taking part in the pilot phase within the framework of the Free Roads Strategy for the documentation and digital publication of collections from colonial context held in Germany. As part of that project, our colleagues were tasked with a case study for identifying objects from colonial context. During that work, it became clear that they needed to produce clear and consistent criteria and procedures to support the decision process. While this will be particularly helpful for the communication with creators and the data management department within the institution, it is also seen as a starting point for the development of future technical routines to automate tagging objects from colonial context. The historians working at the Berlin Natural History Museum have produced this decision tree to classify objects according to their, to their colonial provenance. The tree uses information about locality, supplier, collection time to decide about the potential colonial context for the object. The starting point of our analysis was therefore the question, what about the decision trees in machine learning? Can these classification algorithms play a role in this context? If you are not familiar with decision trees, you can see here an example of how these algorithms can be used to classify a data set. At each step, the algorithm branches out in a tree-like structure, and from this comes the name. Decision trees are machine learning models with many features that make them a good choice to approach classification problems. They are easy to implement and have clear decision boundaries. Most important, decision trees are interpretable models. That is to say, it is possible to understand the decision process and extract a set of classification rules from the decision tree. For instance, in the classification of a well-known botanical dataset known as the Iris dataset, you can extract the following classification rules, those that you see in the slide, from the decision tree, and you can read them as if-then statements. 
It would be desirable to have a similar set of rules for classifying the objects with a potential colonial past. There is a problem though, and it was not a minor one. Decision trees require labeled data, but at present we do not have a labeled data set of museum objects for training and testing the model. We had therefore to rethink our project considering the data available. The historians carried out their project using a small data set of a few hundred objects extracted from the Mammal collection. We decided therefore to use the same collection as a test case. From this collection, we could extract a data set of about 60,000 objects. However, we needed to drop many records due to missing information. We ended up with a data set of just over 20,000 records. For these records, we focused only on information about place and time, neglecting the tax taxonomic information, which requires some complex pre-processing if one wants to use machine learning algorithms. As mentioned, the data are unlabeled. Thus, we had two goals in mind. The first goal was to find an automatic way to label the data, and the second goal was to build a decision tree model and test whether the model could find the rules used to label the data. A positive answer would mean that there is a point in investing time and work to prepare an accurately and labeled data set of colonial objects, train a decision tree model on it, and then reuse this model across the museum's collections. To accomplish our first goal, we used the guidelines published by the German Museum Association for the curation of collections from colonial context. The guidelines contain a list of colonial countries and time periods in the appendix. We used this information to extract a list of countries that had been part of the German Empire with related time periods. The list provides geographical information at country level, and we could match this information with the country information available in our dataset. When a country was only part of a German colony, we chose to assign all items collected in the country during the colonial rule as potentially colonial, as there was no way to provide a more fine-grained labeling. In the plot, you see the labeled dataset of the objects in the mammal collection. You see in orange the objects labeled as potentially colonial. It is evident that the dataset is very unbalanced. With the approach chosen, just over 5,000 objects are potentially colonial. An unbalanced data set is a problem in classification tasks, as the algorithm is likely to favor the most common class. Another intrinsic issue is that in this data set, there are some countries missing from the list shown before. Therefore, we are missing the training examples for some of the classification rules. But this is the best that could be done with the data available. Given the exploratory nature of our approach, at this stage we did not do any real pre-processing of the dataset features. We just standardized the country names and encoded the country as a categorical variable. At this stage, we also avoided any cross-validation, as the real aim was to understand that the process can work in principle and there is a point in investing time and effort in creating a reliable data set of manually labeled the data to train a decision tree. As a proof of concept, the system can work. You see here an example of a tree model classifying our data set. Key colonial nations and timeframes are identified. If not proved, the tree would be able to discover all rules used in labeling the data. But there are caveats. First of all, the dataset we used does not have an adequate representation of some of the former German colonies. Therefore, the model cannot learn any rule related to those nations. The second issue is that working at the country level and not at the locality level is a quite rough approximation for the countries that were only in part the former German colonies. Last but not least, we begin to think that rule set models might be a better tool for our problem. Unlike decision trees, with rule set models, more than one rule may apply for any particular record. If multiple rules apply, the final prediction is decided by combining the weighted votes of all the rules that apply to the record in question. In this way, we could also introduce the information about the collector that was considered by the historians. 
As you can see, we have plenty to do for the future in terms of selecting proper training data, exploring the most suited machine learning models, and of course, putting the colonial labels back into the museum's collections once we have created them. Feedback is welcome if you have faced similar problems in the past. Thank you very much for attending the talk. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out. Our contact details are available here. Okay, so I don't think Judith is online, um, but we do have um, Marike Peterson here in the room if anybody has any questions, um, as well as uh, they're welcome to ask questions online. Thanks. Um, a, a quick question, really. So is there a risk that we're imposing a kind of colonial bias on our records by making that kind of locality assumption? So I know I'm from the Natural History Museum in London, obviously rich colonial history. Many of our collections, they were collected by working with a network of indigenous people to start with. Sometimes those are properly credited often they are not. But I think, are there, are there risks around that locality assumption when you're doing this machine learning? Because that, that, that a lot of that other information is not on the label. Um, I think it, it's just a start. Vince, you're totally right. So of course, we do not know most of the information and also the, the data which were collected by that time is really limited in information itself. So you are lucky if you have some, some agent which might be the collector, but it could be also somebody else. It might not be the collector because maybe it was collected by some indigenous people where you do not have the name. So I think it's, it's a challenge, but it was kind because we had this kind of project with the three roads strategy. And we were trying to identify a data set, which is assured to be, um, from the colonial past. And then in collaboration with our historians, we came up with the idea of this kind of decision tree. But of course, it was what Jadita mentioned. It is a challenge, but I think it's um, it, it's just an approach how to label it and how also we can use all those kind of different initiatives we heard today um, to make our collection even a bit more richer with more information. If nobody else has a question, I have a question because we are currently um, um, trying to find a, a place in our infrastructure where we are putting this kind of information afterwards because it is an annotation of our collection. It is driven from a research project, for example. And um, so the collection managers do not want to have this information in the collection management system, which is fair enough. Um, so if you have any ideas and if you are doing this similarly, um, I'm happy to talk about that. This might be a good moment then. So that was our last presentation and we have about 10 minutes left to the hour. Um, so I would, for, it looks like Mao, you're queuing up over there to, <laughs> um, but I, before, um, First of all, I would like to say thank you, everybody. Thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you for attending. Um, and um, and I think uh, as part of this discussion, I'd, I'd like to prompt you all with the question of more broadly, what can we as Tadwig do as a community to operationalize uh, care principles, to implement care principles in what we do? Um, I think it's a, a, something we really need to think about going forward. It's something Peggy and Abby, I, Peggy and Abby and I spoke about quite a bit in preparing for this. So. Um, I'd, lo I'd love to see the, the conversation meander in that direction. And with that, I'll hand the floor back over. Do you have a question? Well, you look like you had a response or a question, maybe. So, um, no, no, well, 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 well maybe, maybe, just a, maybe just a comment. I mean, I think it's a, an interesting, interesting reflection on, you know, what sort of, uh, can, can you replace one bias with another bias? And, and what are, what are sort of the implications of that? And um, 
I don't know. I think it's 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 in some ways it depends on whether it's um, whether it's something that's stopping an initiative to try and move things forward. You know, it acts as a kind of a break and and asking those questions, or whether you can kind of move down that that sort of track and then just sort of critically assess it as you go along. Because until you've sort of done some of that work, you can't see what the um, what the implications might be. I mean, I was kind of interested with the the colonial uh, kind of that colonial exercise because yeah. I think there needs to be probably more exercises that try and do sort of you know more making use of more machine learning just because you know it'll take forever to try and do it you know any other way. Um, but there's always it's never going to be perfect, and it's sort of you know how do you just step towards something that's um, a little bit better and a little bit closer? And I think that you know there's those kind of two questions you know what sorts of things need to sit. Um, within a record, I know when we were working with Manaki Fenua um, and adding the labels, they added them to the digital record, but they won't add them to the physical record. And so that sort of made a distinction like that. Um, but there's probably um, yeah, that space for information that isn't quite the, on the formal record, but sort of in development and process, something like that. I don't know what that looks like, but good thing for this group to think about. So I have a, a sort of thought that's related to that, which is um, with the local context labels, is there a label that exists that you could use as sort of as a flag of say, this requires more conversation, but we don't think we have the information yet to, you know, confidently put a label on it with one way or, or the other. Um, and I'm thinking about that in my, my everyday work as a data manager for um, the U.S. Geological Survey, where I might come across a record where um, perhaps like a nation is mentioned, um, but I don't have the time at that moment to, um, you know, reach out to the POC and, and get into a whole nother conversation about it. What kind of label can I put on that so that 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 thought doesn't get lost? So, um yeah, so 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 one of the distinctions we've made is that the labels are only ever put on by the communities, and okay. so it's not a kind of research or institution that decides what might be there, even if it's on the basis of you know kind of conversations, um, and it's the notices that get put in place, and there's a notice there that's attribution incomplete, but all all of the notices in some ways sort of have that effect of being the placeholder mm. um, until you know what whatever work is done, we kind of hoping is that um, certainly as a, as a community, say so, so like what the work that we've done with um, Manaka Whenua uh, means that we're already sort of attuned to how it might be applied. So then as other institutions start to make space for labels to be applied in their context, it becomes much easier for us to do it there. Um, and it hopefully starts to require less and less conversations at least specifically around that, but there might be different kind of conversations that it, that it that it starts up, or or ones around you know how um kind of different sorts of traditional knowledge might be brought into the collection. Uh, um, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. I, I, it was it was also related to um, to uh, Mariki, your question, um, or maybe I, I forget who asked it over here, but this this idea of like if your sort of intuition or your bias is you know, making this a poor label, then what can you do? And so maybe a notice of, you know, a, a colonial label, but then with a, an attribution and complete sort of combination might be a way of saying it needs more conversation, you know? Yeah, so, so one of the things that um, I didn't mention in the talk and someone was asking me about um, afterwards is that labels themselves aren't, uh, they're not legal, it's not a legal instrument. So it's specifically an extra legal one. And so um, what's it? I mean, it, it came about just as uh, because, you know, most of the times the copyright sits somewhere else, not with the communities, and therefore licensing isn't possible. But there's all these different sort of conversations that are happening around that, specifically the legal part and copyright and licenses and, and where those things sit. But those conversations can happen alongside each other. Um, and certainly within the sort of the Library of Congress and the way that they set things up is that the the uh, local context labels sit within the rights field alongside the legal rights. So, you know, kind of rights doesn't necessarily just have to be legal things and they can kind of sit there and coexist and allow that information to be used in, you know, whatever way. And ended up with the, um, these sort of language, uh, language recordings that actually were, um, had the copyright 
sitting in the Library of Congress, the copyright was with the Peabody Museum at Harvard University. Um, but after sort of six years of them both being there, the, the universities come out and said, hey, look, we're not the right people for, you know, we're not the right entity for people to come if they wanted to do something. And they've asked for their name to be removed from the rights, on the rights field. So now it's just the kind of community that has their, their labels in that place. Okay, thank you. There's a question over here and then over here. Thank you very much. This, the keynote lecture in this session were very much educational for me. I'm, I'm learning here about the care issues and my lesson learned, I see three layers here. There is a special temporal layer. There are lens polygons, uh, which uh, have particular indigenous and local significance. Then there are species which have uh, important ethnobotanical, ethnomycological use and maybe invasive alien species which are particularly destructive and influence the communities. And then there are individuals who themselves associate in a positive or negative way uh, with indigenous and local issues. And that can be seen as linked to orc IDs and, and bionomia and so on. And I think it's within Tadwick powers to tidy up the standards and the data fields at least in these three layers. Maybe I'm missing some important layer here, but implementation of that, I don't really see how, how much Tadwick can do, like being Tadwick, but this is the second indigenous and local session I'm attending. The first one was at the Ecological Society of America in August in Portland, where everybody were finishing the session saying, hey, next year there'll be a conference in Oslo. Everybody will be there and we'll fix it there. Do you share the same uh, uh, sentiment about that conference? Uh, and am I missing an important layer, special temporal species and individual persons? Thank you. Um, I will say that I am up here as also somebody who's learning very much. And so I actually was not aware of that, that conference in Oslo. Um, so um, we'll just sort of pass that for now and then we'll go to the next question. Thank you. Um, Alison Vaughan from Royal Botanic Gardens, Victoria. To go back to your question, Steve, about tagging records and um, Maui thanks for that clarification about that it's communities who put those labels on but for me I would love there to be a field in Darwin Core that we can tag as this has biocultural information on it or whatever the terminology is perhaps a vocabulary under that or, or you know set of options because our herbarium has specimens collected from all over the continent for hundreds of different language groups and some of them have um, biocultural information. They have what's potentially secret, sacred knowledge. They have medicinal information that could be exploited, fiber uses, all of these things. And so what I've done is I've extract, removed that from public view so it can't be exploited with the hope that we then have to go and create those relationships, consult with people and make sure that we are looking after that information in culturally sensitive and appropriate ways. And, but before, you know, that's a lot of relationships that we have to build. And it would be beneficial if through sort of an ALA view, those where, where those records are mapped, that if there was a flag that said biocultural information, then a language group could go and have a look and go, okay, all of these records have some kind of information that is culturally important to us. They can reach out or we can do that relationship building at a national level rather than institution by institution. Um, so I'd love to see, yeah, flags like that as a starting point for sort of getting that big view of what's actually in our collections. Okay. Yeah, we have time for probably one more question or comment. Um, this is Steve Baskoff. I, my comment is that this is totally doable. It just needs people to do it. There's, I mean, you could form a task group or uh, open issue. I, in fact, I think there is an issue. I was trying to find it somewhere about developing this, but it doesn't move forward unless there's a group of people who make it move forward. It's totally doable within the framework. It just needs work to be done. Oh, and I apologize. We missed one question. We have, uh, let's see, David Bloom online. Um, forgive my probable ignorance, but is there an effort to create a repository for an indigenous knowledge or for indigenous knowledge, similar to a morph bank or gen bank, that could maintain these data and link them semantically to legacy records in various museum and collections elsewhere. Um, I'm not sure. Does anybody else? 
<laughs> no, no, and there's probably a, 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 a huge amount of resistance to it. But I think what you're seeing is um, uh, in different countries, partly through uh, kind of signatories to the CBD and the Goya, um, as they start to try and think about um, uh, supporting by discovery kind of activities, they often have to create um, traditional knowledge databases. And um, this sort of mixes between the ones that have been put in place in places like India and South Africa. And as, as that legislation comes into place, they have to create those sorts of infrastructures around it. And um, sort of a bit of a debate about whether they're there as a sort of a defensive mechanism to stop people getting patents on traditional medicines from, from different places, or whether they're uh, being created in ways that the community can also use for kind of their own, own purposes as well. Uh, but that's a kind of an ongoing thing. I think in um, South Africa, they've got a slightly more distributed, regionally based model than a, a centralized one. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody, so much. Um, one more round of applause for our speakers. And if, if anybody might be interested in talking about this more as an unconference later in the week, please feel free to approach Peggy and myself, and uh, we'll see where it goes.